So uh, I'm going to speak about an overview of biomarkers in, uh, in migraine. I don't have any disclosures to report. And I start with this. Well, this is our approach for migraine today. We have the international classification criteria for headache disorders, and we use them to uh, diagnose migraine. And these criteria and this, class this classification uh, made a huge progress in headache disorders. And that's why we are very happy for these uh, 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 criteria. However, if we can find biomarkers to diagnose migraine, to also monitor the progression of migraine and also maybe tell us something about the treatment of migraine, it will be very helpful. So, we can have the genetic biomarkers, provocation biomarkers, biological samples biomarkers, and imaging biomarkers. I'm very lucky to be here today because we know that Professor Ashina told us yesterday about provocation models. So later today, we will have a great lecture from Professor Gisla about the genetic biomarkers. And after that, we will have a session from, uh, 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 by, by Professor Debihe about the blood biomarkers and also by Faisal Amin with imaging biomarkers. So, let me start with the genetic biomarkers and overview. The first thing we know that from twin study, twin study showed that the heritability of migraine is about 42%. And this is very nice, and this is also not that surprising because migraine, because migraine is very common disease, uh, and we expect that common diseases may lay about 50% because we have genetic factors, we have also environmental factors as well. We also know that the relative risk to develop migraine without aura, if you have a first degree alert relative with that, is 1.9. We also know the risk, the relative risk of developed migraine with aura is about 4, if you have a relative first degree relative with that. We proceed with the genetic biomarkers. We know that epigenetic studies show that there are 62 methylated regions in the DNA of migraine patients. And what does that mean? Well, it means that if you have methylation, it means that that gene is inactivated. So we have 62 inactivated genes in migraine patients comparing to healthy subjects, uh, individuals without migraine. A new study published this year showed that there are 123 uh, genomic loci influence migraine risk. And a lot of these genes, genes are expressed in vascular tissues. We also know that if you have a high polygenic load, then you will respond more and the efficacy of tryptin will be more uh, uh, for you if we compare it to patients with low polygenic load. And this is very interesting. So as you can see here, we have a lot of genetic information from the twin study all the way until we come to the treatment response. But do we have a one responsible gene for migraine? If we look at the monogenetic subtypes of migraine and also migraine-related syndromes, yes, we might have one or two or three responsible genes, as is the case with the FHM patients, with Cadacil also, we can have one responsible gene, 
two responsible genes for migraine. But do we have that for the common types of migraine, for migraine with aura, migraine without aura? It's very challenging because we know a lot of factors here. There are multiple genetic variants when we speak about migraine with aura and migraine without aura. We have also a, a polygenic contribution and small effect size, and there are also environmental factors, and we also need a, a, a large-scale study to find some genes influencing more and more migraine with aura and without aura. So despite a, a, a very a, a, a huge contribution uh, from the genetic study, we also still need a lot of information to find uh, genes that contribute a lot to migraine with aura and without aura. More of that will come later today. The second biomarkers we have is the provocation biomarkers. We heard a lot of that. I'm going to repeat that again just to make it very clear. What does that mean that we have provocation biomarker? At the Dench Headache Center, we invite migraine and try to provoke migraine. So we study migraine by provoking migraine. By doing that, we can register the headache. We can also take blood samples. We can do uh, 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 MR studies. So we can actually access the patient in very controlled uh, 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 environment. And we can study migraine by that. So what's the design we use in the provocation uh, model? Usually we invite migraine patients and we divide them in two groups. One group with the active drugs, the other group with the placebo, and we do the crossover with the active drug and placebo, and we uh, 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 register the headache, the uh, associated symptoms with migraine. This is the provocation model. And we have done the provocation models for now 42 years. And because of this lecture, uh, 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 I tried to summarize what we have achieved with the provocation model from 1998 until now. So this slides may be very heavy, but if you start with me, we can take it one by one. And we have Professor, Ashin, uh, Professor Olsen to correct us. After that, Professor Ashina. So if we start in 1980 uh, here, we have histamine, the first study. Histamine infusion could cause headache. And this study was supported by another study 15 years later in 1995, where histamine also it caused, induced migraine, and that migraine was inhibited by histamine one receptor antagonist. This is the first study with the provocation model. After that, in 1993, GTN, the nitric oxide donor, showed to induce migraine attacks. In that study, we had 10 migraine patients invited, and eight of them reported migraine attacks after GTN. Some years later, precisely 20 years ago, CGRP studies published in Cephalalgia came out, and in that study we had nine migraine patients where six of them reported migraine attacks. So I'm moving slowly, can you, can you see that? So we take it step by step. One year later, 2003, we know that sildenafil what is, the, what is the, the sildenafil Viagra? We know uh, sildenafil. Sildenafil inhibit the degradation of cyclic GMP. And sildenafil showed to induce migraine attacks in 10 of 12 migraine patients. The induction rate was 
We heard from uh, Professor Ashina yesterday that PACAP 38 induced migraine attacks in 7 of 12 people. In that study, they included also a, a, a headache, a healthy subject. They also reported headache. So then we had two studies in 2010 and 2012 with the prostanoids, prostanoid I2 and E2. And if you remember from the lecture by Professor Ashina yesterday, we know that uh, prostanoids I2 induced delayed headache, whereas prostanoid E2 induced immediate headache. So in 2004, but 14, excuse, 14, Celestasol by Dr. Gu, is he with us today? He was here yesterday, by Dr. Du. Dr. Du included 14 migraine patients and 12 of them reported migraine attacks after Celestasol. Celestasol actually uh, is similar to sildenafil. The difference is sildenafil inhibits the degradation of cyclic GMP. Celestasol inhibits the degradation of cyclic uh, AMP. Now, so uh, uh, Professor Ashina and colleagues in 2019 showed that leukomokalim, the ATP-sensitive potassium channel opener, induced migraine attacks in 16 of 16 migraine patients. The induction rate was 100%. Some months later, Dr. Ganizada, who is also with us today, showed that PACAP 27, and can you see the difference here? This is what PACAP 38, uh, uh, and here PACAP 27. PACAP 27 induced migraine attacks in 11 of 20 patients. The induction rate was 55% of PACAP 27. It's very similar to the induction rate of PACAP 38. PACAP 38 induced migraine in seven of 12 patients. So 2021, the last year, was very heavy year for the provocation model. So Maxipost, induce also. Maxipost is another drug. It works downstream the signaling cascade, which I'm going to show you in, the in a few slides. Maxipost opens the big channel, also potassium channel, and Maxipost shows that uh, uh, we can induce migraine in 98% uh, uh, of migraine patients. Dr. Ganizara come again and showed adrenomodulin shows all, induce also migraine attacks, the same induction rate of PACAP27 and also of other peptides. VIB, VIB, the first time VIB was studied, it was in 2008, but later, 2021, uh, Dr. Pelisi showed that if you give VIB in two hours infusion, then you will have induction of migraine about uh, 70 percent. Uh, Dr. Pelisi included 20 patients with migraine without aura and induced migraine after infusion of VIB with two hours. We heard a lot of, uh, about emulin study from Dr. Ganizara yesterday, and I spoke about leukomakalim and aura also yesterday. So this is what we actually know about the provocation model. I might have missed some studies, I don't know, you may correct me, but, but this is what we know right now, and this is the flow we know about the provocation model. So it took me actually eight hours to do this study, to this slide, only this slide. Yeah. <coughs> so now, can we take all these uh, uh, molecules together and put it in a signaling pathway just to see where these molecules work together? So, if we take a look, VIB, amulin, adrenomodulin, PACAP 27 and PACAP 38, and also CGRB, 
All these molecules are peptides and they work on the sure phase receptors, G protein coupler receptor. These molecules here, they activate the receptor and they activate the adenyl cyclase, which will increase the amount of cyclic AMP. When we have cyclic AMP, we will then stimulate the protein kinase A. Protein kinase A will eventually cause phosphorylation of the ion channels. Both of them, KATP channel and also the big channel. So we know that this signaling pathway here works downstream all the way down. I saw that there, there, there is a new study also from the Danish Headache Center, it's just accepted in the brain, where, where they differentiate between these peptides and the downstream mechanism. Very uh, uh, nice study. <clears throat> if we go on the other way here, GTN, nitric oxide donor, will activate the guanyl cyclase, which will increase cyclic GMP, and cyclic GMB will stimulate protein kinase G and then will cause phosphorylation. So even though we are speaking about two parallel signaling pathways, we think that there is a common, a common pathway downstream, a common, a common down, downstream pathway. Regarding celestosol, so if you have cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP will be degraded to AMP. AMP has no function in the cell. AMP will usually be, 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 be built up again to be ATP. So we can inhibit the degradation of cyclic AMP by celestosol. If we do that, then if we give celestosol, then the cyclic AMP concentration will be sustained high. The same goes for sildenafil. Sildenafil inhibits the degradation of cyclic GMB. That's why when you give sildenafil, cyclic GMB will remain high. This cell we are showing here is a smooth muscle cell. This is what we think. It might be a neuron. We don't know. Now, for the next biomarkers, we have here the blood biomarkers. And as I told you, told you we have a lecture by Professor uh, Debihe about the blood biomarkers. If we are going to speak about the blood biomarkers, I also included the salivary biomarkers because of a new study came up uh, uh, two months ago. So we are going to speak about the salivary and blood biomarkers here. We have the interictal phase and the ictal phase of migraine. What do we know about blood biomarkers so far? So we have to start with two studies. The first study measured the CGRB level in migraine, episodic migraine, and compared them to healthy volunteers, people, individual without migraine. In this study, the first study, they showed that CGRP level is higher in people with migraine comparing to people without migraine, episodic migraine patients. The other study showed that also in chronic migraine patients, the CGRP level is higher comparing to individual without migraine. So we have two studies now. The first one showing CGRP level is higher in episodic, the other in chronic, comparing to individual without migraine. As we know in science, then Dr. Miji Lee published a study where she measured the CGRB level in episodic migraine patients, in chronic migraine patients, and in, 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 in healthy subjects, individual without migraine. She couldn't find any difference. So, we move forward here, the new study. 
So, and, 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 and Professor Ashina told me to remove this picture because he told me, what's that? It, I told him, this is the salivary. We, we measure the CGRB in the uh, saliva, but this is what we mean. Uh, uh, a new study published in Zephelelgia two months ago. In this study, they measured CGRB, salivary CGRB, before the attack and also during the attack. They reported that CGRB is elevated in migraine patients compared to healthy volunteers outside the attack. During the attack, they showed that CGRB is increased in some migraine patients, but not all the migraine patients. And that's why they concluded there are CGRB-dependent migraine attacks and CGRB independent migraine attacks because of that study. So, uh, just to uh, uh, we, we go back here, how about PACAP? Because we, we, we spoke a lot about PACAP. There are two studies who tried to measure PACAP without migraine interactively phase, they couldn't find any signal from PACAP. That's why I only included. CGRB in this uh, phase of migraine. If we go to the ictal phase of migraine, one of the first studies measuring uh, CGRP in the external jugular veins from uh, Professor Gosby, he reported that the CGRP level is increased in patients during the attack, and he compared this data with historical data. The other study here, they measured CGRP in the peripheral blood and reported CGRP is also increased in migraine patients during the attack comparing to people without migraines. And what do you think I'm going to show you now? As I did with the interactive, I'm going to do it with the actual phase. The study here, uh, 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 Tvitsko tried, Dr. Tvitsko tried to measure CGRB during the attack in the central blood, peripheral blood. He couldn't find any signal. It repeated itself from the interactive phase and actual phase. How about PACAP? Do we know something about PACAP here in the, in, in, in the ICTEL phase? Yes, we have two studies. Uh, 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 these two studies reported that PACAP uh, uh, immunoreactivity. So it means that it may be PACAP 27 or PACAP or and PACAP 38. PACAP immunoreactivity is increased during the attack in migraine patients compared to individual without migraine. So we have something about PACAP during the ictal phase, but nothing about PACAP during the interactal phase. And you still remember that this study here also measured, this study here also measured CGRP during the ictal phase in the uh, uh, saliva. This is what we know about a blood biomarkers. Now for the imaging biomarkers. We can divide the imaging biomarkers to uh, structure uh, biomarkers, structure imaging, and functional imaging. And here we can, the, the, the arrow here is showing the white matter of the cortex, a uh, uh, white matter of the uh, cerebrum because we have one study, the CAMERA study from the Netherlands group, published in 2004. The study is population-based study, where they tried to see if there is any difference between migraine people and people without migraine. They reported in that CAMERA study that there is white matter hyperintensity in migraine people. They also reported subclinical infects in the posterior vesiculation. 
particularly in the uh, uh, cerebellum and also white matter lesions in the brainstem, comparing to uh, 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 people without migraine. A meta-analysis from Bashir showed that there is white matter hyperintensity in migraine people with aura if we compare them to the controls. If we compare migraine without aura with migraine with aura, there was no difference. So the conclusion of that meta-analysis is white matter hyperintensity is found in migraine with aura if we compare them to the controls, but not if we compare migraine with aura and without aura patients. Uh, Geist, in this study published in Brain, two studies published in Brain, uh, uh, tried to include female uh, 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 with migraine with aura and compare them to the control patients and found also there is white matter hyperintensity in the visual cortex. This is very nice because we know that the cortical spreading depression, the physiological substrate of migraine aura, it might arise from the visual cortex. Some years later, a meta-analysis showed that there is no difference. How about functional imaging? What do we know about that? We heard a very nice debate uh, from Dr. Roberto and Cedric about the premonitory symptoms and the hypothalamus, and they actually uh, uh, used a lot of these studies reported here. So, let me start with, the, with, with this one, with the cortical spreading depression here. A study from uh, Yeah, maybe I should start with the actim, uh, hypothalamus activation. It's better. Yes. Let me start with the hypothalamus activation. Hypothalamus activation. Why? Because of the premonitory symptoms. We have two studies about the hypothalamus activation. The first one with the spontaneous migraine attacks, and the second one is with the GTN-induced migraine attacks. Both of studies published in, in Brain, and this study reported that in the interictal phase of migraine, there is hypothalamus activation. Two studies, one of them spontaneous migraine attacks, the other one is a, a GTN-induced migraine attack, and they reported hypothalamus activation. Haji Khani, in, in this study in 2001, she reported that there was, the, 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 there was activation of the visual cortex, and that activation could indicate the cortical spreading depression in migraine with aura patients, during the aura. The last we know that during migraine, during the ictal phase of migraine, we also have two studies. The first study here is when you have a spontaneous migraine attacks, you have activation of the dorsal pons. The other study uh, is when you have GTN-induced migraine attack, you have also activation of the dorsal pons. So it means that we have different uh, uh, sites of activation. We have the hypothalamus activation during the premonitory phase, which was discussed heavily yesterday, and we have also activation of the visual cortex during the aura. At the end, we have pons, dorsal pons activation, which means that there is some activation of the trigeminal pain pathway during the migraine pain. So now, we spoke about the genetic biomarkers, the, the provocation biomarkers, uh, blood biomarkers, genetic biomarkers. Can we combine these, uh, uh, combine these uh, uh, biomarkers together? We already did that because I told you, I just told you that this is a GTN induced, so they used actually the uh, provocation biomarkers with the imaging. 
And Afredi also showed that there is a dorsal pons activation after GTN induced migraine. So they also co combined their GTN induced migraine with the imaging biomarkers. So here, ladies and gentlemen, can we combine, can we, can we integrate the biomarkers of migraine? Because by doing that, we can achieve a huge amount of information to uh, understand the pathophysiology of migraine. So, Dr. Hansen reported that in this study, he included migraine patient with the FHM and tried to induce migraine attack with CGRP, but he couldn't. So he com combined genetic biomarkers with the provocation biomarkers. Dr. Gu tried to understand why it is possible to induce migraine attacks in some people and not in other people. That's why he tried to uh, 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 analyze the patient if they have high family load. And what does that mean, family load? It means that if you have one or more, excuse me, if you have more than one of your family member with migraine, then it means that you have high family load. If you have one or less of your uh, first degree relatives with migraine, then you have low family load. And these patients were provoked with PACAP, but he couldn't find any difference with patient with high family load with comparing with patient with low family load. We did actually the same with leukoma kalim, with uh, uh, aura. We tried also to understand why it was possible to induce aura in 10 and possible one, so 11, uh, 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 of 17 migraine patients. So we interviewed the patients and we asked them about the first degree relatives, if they have migraine with aura. Also migraine without aura, these data are published. We tried to understand, does it mean anything that you have high family load to induce migraine with aura? We couldn't find any, uh, 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 any association, association between family load and induction of migraine. What if we combined imaging and provocation biomarkers? We saw two studies previously in the previous slides, but we also know that uh, uh, Amin uh, showed in, in brain 2014 and also in, uh, in neurology showed that there is uh, abnormal activation of different several uh, cortex area during migraine attacks provoked by CGRP. Uh, we, he also reported that PACAP induced migraine was also associated with vasodilation of the middle meningeal artery. But he couldn't find any difference because migraine is usually unilateral head pain. He couldn't find any difference of the, of the vasodilation is related to the pain side or not. Some years later, Dr. Khan reported that uh, uh, the migraine induced by celestasol is actually associated with the vasodilation on the pain side of the middle meningeal arteries. So as you can see here, we can use the provocation model with the genetic, uh, we can use provocation with imaging, we can also use provocation with the uh, 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 blood samples. So these biomarkers are available now we can combine these biomarkers to achieve more information about migraine. This is what I needed to say. I will be happy to listen to your questions. Thank you, Mohammed, for a very nice presentation uh, and an overview for this biomarker uh, topic. 
Um, we'll do like yesterday, so we will have one question from the audience, then one from the viewers, and then we change, okay? And the mic should be here in, uh, in this room. Andreas? <laughs> Uh, Dr. Rakhbogodi, my name is Hashmat Ganizara, and thank you for uh, a brilliant presentation. Um, it seems that we are still looking or searching for biomarkers, and uh, there is some limitation with blood imaging. And uh, so, what is your take? Uh, where should we look, and uh, how we should uh, uh, do our uh, uh, future? Um, analysis to find a precise biomarkers that we couldn't until now. Thank you. So, uh, thank you. Very nice question, uh, Dr. Ganizara. What I think is uh, the, the approach for the, the future approach for the biomarkers is the following. Because until now, what we had, these studies I reported, they are usually small sample size studies so, and also it was very hard to reproduce the results. The future studies should be large scale studies with a huge sample size, I'm talking about 300, 400, uh, maybe 500 migraine patients, comparing them to uh, 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 individual without migraine. What we should do is to try to take blood samples of these uh, 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 patients and we try to also scan these patients before uh, uh, the start of treatment and also after the start of the treatment and find out whether we can find some signal in the uh, uh, blood or the imaging uh, or the provocation also. By doing that, you can close a lot of doors because right now we're still speaking about CGRP, PACAP, blood samples, and the first study was published in 1990. And 30 years later, we're still speaking about that. So by doing a large-scale study, then you can close the door of CGRB or open it again. Maybe also find out if there is amulin in the blood, uh, or if there is adrenomodulin in the blood. So this is the way to, 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 to approach it in the future. Thank I you. think, uh, 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 according to my opinion. Yeah. I hope Dr. Kanizar is satisfied with the question or Are the answer. You? We can take, take it later. <laughs> Thank you, Mohammed. We have another question from uh, uh, Ayodi S. Suni. Uh, do you have a view on whether all the other peptides change in the same way as CGRP? How many of these studies have measured the neuropeptides in the same samples? Uh, we, uh, VIB is measured, PACAP also is measured, but VIB, there was no uh, uh, signal. PACA was no signal. Emulin is also measured with no uh, uh, signal. The only, uh, 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 during the insectal phase, I showed you that during the ictal phase, PACA was measured and PACA was actually high. Uh, CGRP is measured, two studies in the ictal phase, high CGRP, two studies in the uh, intellectual phase with high CGRP, and we have study with the ictal phase, intact phase, show, uh, interactive phase shows negative, negative results. So we know that emulin, VIB, and PACAB are also measured. Uh, uh, so, so other peptides should we also be measured uh, uh, also to, to understand. So, so this is what they measured so far. Uh, is there any? Yeah. Adrenomedulin, I, I don't, if, if my mind serves me correctly, I don't know, no one measured adrenomedulin so far. Thank you. We have another um, question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have uh, an, another question. Um, because the results are amazing, because all the peptides and the channels you observed are almost works on migraine patients and have little effect on health controls. 
Um, how do you have the suggestions for suggestions for our future study? We should focus on the vasodilation, some re, uh, res, receptors on the vasodilation, or we can have another perspective on like the neuron activation, or how about the microglia activation? Uh, because there are many specific receptors on microglia, we can do a lot of work on it. So thank you. Yes. So where are we now in the headache field regarding the neuronal activation or vasodilation? We are far more beyond the glial activation. We don't know that much about glial activation in migraine field. And I don't like the idea of separating the vasodilation from the neuronal activation because we know if you induce vasodilation, you will have neuronal activation. You cannot induce vasodilation and the neurons remain silent. You cannot do that because of the fibers surrounding the vessels, right? And we have also to remember, during the provocation studies, can you give me one single molecule we used in the provocation studies that was not vasodilator? All the molecules we used from 1980 until now they are vasodilating molecules, and they induce migraine, right? So we cannot separate the vasodilation from neuronal activation. However, I think, yes, I think uh, uh, glial cells uh, are very important, uh, particularly, uh, particularly the astrocyte, because they control the neural activation. But how much do we know about that in migraine field? I have another question. Um, oh, I'm thank you for now. beautiful uh, slides. And um, I was I was looking for now again for I've seen it many times before of the the big cell with the receptors and the intracellular mechanisms and so on. And all of a sudden, it struck me. I never thought about this before that there are many uh, receptor ligands that are activating the cyclic AMP system, there was absolutely zero ligands activating the cyclic GMP system. Mm -hmm. Have you stumbled upon any, no. any ligand that can activate the system? No. Because when we activate that system, we I always do it intracellularly, either with yeah. nitric oxide yeah. or with uh, sildenafil. But, but I can explain that from the basal uh, 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 mechanism. Uh, which I teach about that in many years, because the adrenal cyclase is, adrenal cyclase is usually uh, soluble in the cell, inside the cell. It's not attached to the membrane. If you go to adrenal cyclase, adrenal cyclase, you can find it attached to the membrane uh, 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 always, and that's why you need the G-protein couple receptor to activate that. The guanyl cyclase, which produce the cyclic GMP, it's actually inside the cell. I saw some studies, but not reported in the cell, the book cell we read in medicine school, that the, 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 the uh, uh, guanyl cyclase is only inside the cell and not, uh, not attached to the membrane. That's why you cannot activate it by uh, uh, ligands on the surface receptors. No, but uh, it's true, but, but there is also membrane-bound uh, yeah, some of them, cyclase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as I remember, and you didn't bring this on your slide, then these um, atrial natriuretic peptides, yeah. they are supposed to activate the membrane-bound um, granular cyclase. But oh. I think, um, they failed was it Sangu who worked on this? Who worked? Uh, Gu, yeah, Gu reported Gu, that in brief reports. Was, I don't remember the results. They were not very clear results with these. Oh, This is, of course, a big problem in human studies. We, if something does not cause a migraine attack, we, we can't be sure that it's, it, it, it couldn't have done so if we could give it much more. But no, we, we, we are limited to... Yeah, we didn't give it to, to patients. 
No. And we oh. conduct experiments with uh, Volu volunteers. In, in volunteers, uh, and we saw such a uh, you know uh, such a strong effect uh, hypertension, and that's why we moved uh, from that. But it is a very interesting also area. The because other the reason that yes, oh, yeah. Yeah. and the other possibility is of course acetylcholine, and I know Henrik Schutz of course with Miss Wood studied capacholine. I'm I'm wondering. If that does not actually, it was it was high placebo response, right? <coughs> yeah, that was problem. Yeah. But but it looked like it would probably have caused migraine Absolutely. if we had a normal mm. uh, sort of normal uh, placebo response. But I think that the capacol probably activates the, the guanylate cyclase. So I'm not sure. No, it, I mean, the idea Is was endothelial receptor endothelial, activation? Yeah. Ah, yeah, then it makes NO. And but it it yeah. induces, yeah, it, it's yeah. upregulated nitric oxide. So yeah. indirectly it goes yeah. into the cell, but mm. not on a cellular. No, no. it's not, not the. No. no. And, and that's and actually it's not a G couple. Uh, the only problem was that uh, Henrik had a very high nocebo response uh, yeah. uh, in his patients. I don't know, maybe because of Henrik. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, Henrik. But it was quite un unusual uh, yeah. nocebo response. But otherwise, uh, 50% of the patients, I think, Eric, they develop, please correct me if I'm wrong, they develop a migraine attacks after carbacol. So the idea was that was indirect release of nitric oxide causing uh, migraine attacks. Uh, but there is also one important point, Mohammed, maybe you mixed up a little bit, that uh, you referred to the white matter hypertensities. Uh, the reason that uh, white matter hypertensities are important and being used as a biomarker because as a urologist, I know that sometimes uh, sometimes you get a uh, uh, report from radiologists uh, stating that there are some white matter hypertensities typical for migraine. And this is really bad. If patients read that, they come back to me and say, I mean, something wrong with my brain. You know, I mean, they know that hypertensities are also... Um, kind of uh, described and discussed in context to dementia. And they say, well, maybe my brain, uh, you know, I get brain damage because of migraine attacks. So this is a big problem. So the study that you referred to, yes, they show that there are probably some signals and also the meta-analysis. But in fact, in David Guy's study, which was properly uh, designed in terms of the population based in twins, of course, and also in terms of the uh, size, uh, sample size, plus migraine with aura exclusively, meaning that we know a priori that the migraine patients with aura, they have relative increase of the cardiovascular or, or cerebrovascular events, and that's why females and migraine with aura was the main focus of this study. And this study was completely negative meaning that there was no, you said that there was some difference, but there was no any difference between the control groups and patients in terms of migraine, uh, white matter hypertensities, and also, as Mohammed said, subclinical infarct-like lesions, okay? You cannot say the infarct because infarct also implies deficit, focal sign, but those patients had a sub subclinical uh, change, but there was no difference between the controls and migraine patients. So that was a really good message to migraine patients, right? And, uh, you know, uh, uh, underscoring the, uh, how you design the study. Mohammed, this is just a comment because it's an important comment to make also for our audience uh, online uh, because many neurologists are also attending our conference. You mentioned the, the blood samples, the biomarkers there. Um, can you comment on why we get so much, so, so different results, uh, you know, across the, the status? What could be possible explanation and what should be done to avoid that so we will get more and less, uh, let's say, reproducible results in, uh, in the different labs, different countries and research groups? Thank you. Uh, well, the one possible explanation is that different assays to measure the, 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 the CGRB. But however, we have also studies used different assays, also the same assays reported in the positive studies, but
but they couldn't find any signal. So, so a different essay could be one possible explanation. The time frame of taking the blood samples, when we say, okay, during the, atta the, the attack or before the attack, what the time frame during the attack? It's in the beginning of the attack. It is uh, 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 five hours later of the attack. It could also affect the results of the blood samples. So yes, and the sample size. The sample size is very important factor to also uh, uh, take into consideration. Thank you, Mohammed. We also have another question from the viewers. Uh, it's from Teresa. Thank you for the complete presentation. Do you know if other features other than family load have been taken into account in the provocation studies, i.g. allodynia, or degree of response to tryptans and or monoclonal antibodies slash DPENS? Uh, thank you, Teresa, for that question. Uh, at, at the Danish Health Center, we, we don't take any other and family load. Uh, also because a lot of this study we conducted, it was actually before the monoclonal antibodies or Egyptians. Uh, if you go to the clinical trial, Gov, you will find that uh, there are a lot of ongoing studies using monoclonal antibodies with the uh, provocation models, and uh, the thing, the, uh, my my voice is very okay. 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 So and uh, Teresa, uh, I will uh, also tell you that there is a poster uh, with uh, Dr. Du. He is actually uh, tr he tried to combine the molecular antibodies with the provocation models, and he will. Uh, show us very nice results. Thank you very much. I think we have another question. I can hear you. Andreas is coming with the mic. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have a question because you replied earlier to Yishin that it's impossible to disconnect vasodilation from the migraine attack because no, it's... No, neuronal activation. I said vasodilation and neuronal activation. And yes. then, I, then I said all what we could provoke migraine with yes. were vasodilators. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I have a question on that, that uh, it's true that all migraine provoking molecules are vasodilating the extracerebral arteries, but in Dr. Uh, Amin's study, where he uh, measured the diameter of uh, cerebral and extracerebral arteries during spontaneous and not provoked attacks, there was no dilation. Mm. How do you think this is explained? Yeah. Well, the, the study by uh, uh, Dr. Amin published in Lancet Neurology with the spontaneous migraine attacks, the, the, the very nice studies, However, uh, the studies were uh, dependent on the patients. So when patients feel they have migraine attacks, they could, should take a taxi and come uh, to the Danish Headache Center and be scanned. So again, the time frame of the study, okay, did we, did we scan the patients at the beginning of their migraine attacks where there might be vasodilation and then the vasodilation vanished? Or did we scan the patients five hours later uh, 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 in their migraine attacks without any vasodilation. So uh, we can discuss that. You, you got my point? This is the time frame of the, of the scan of, the, of these patients. Okay, and, so and, and another important uh, uh, point. Can you uh, 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 be sure that there is no vasodilation at all? And, and, and that vasodilation, I mean, you could have a little vasodilation and this vasodilation is not measurable, you know? in these patients. But actually, he also reported, Dr. Amin also reported some vasodilation in the middle and several artery in that article also. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the ICA, exactly. Yeah. Yes, however, it was very small in transients. You think it's the timeline that the prolonged vasodilation is actually I prior the, to the attack? I, th I think the timeline maybe, and also the amount of vasodilation. In spontaneous migraine attacks, you will not expect a huge vasodilation as we can see in the provocation model, right? Because we give them some uh, 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 external compound. Okay, thank you. Mm. Thank you, Lily. Now we have the last question for, uh, for this session. 
from uh, PAL, why only focus on uh, circulating biomarkers, blood? Uh, it is very much diluted and may be below the limit of quantification. So, uh, do you thank you, Dr. Rebel, of, uh, for this question. Do you suggest that we look after uh, adherent biomarkers? Uh, I don't have any comment on that. Adherent biomarkers? Oh, I, think, I think that the comment is that the, the, the pool that you're measuring here is mm. quite, quite huge. Right? But we also measured in the jugular external. Yeah, yeah. how much from the, the jugular, mm. uh, external jugular atrophy. And some studies suggest that there is a very few uh, outflow from the brain in the external jugular vein. In fact, I think that uh, Professor Messlinger showed just recently it's uh, really not a main, let's say, a source for the, the dural outflow. Okay, so it's, it's a questionable. I think what uh, 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 Dr. Teske is referring to is that you're measuring here, but maybe the concentration are increased, elevated locally, and, and you cannot detect that. So maybe we have to take CSF uh, 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 samples. Uh, that will be very invasive during yeah. the provocation but, status. Yeah. And uh, I think that the only way you can look at uh, here, you need uh, a preclinical status. You know, uh, this is the only way you can measure in the different compartments. Because we cannot go in humans yet uh, locally and measure that mm -hmm. from the dura. It will be impossible, you know, for the local circulation. We only, can, we only measure the dilation that uh, you know that uh, the menin, uh, middle meningeal artery dilating. So maybe this is a reflection of the local release of the peptides, uh, but we cannot measure that. Thank you, Masoud. And for you, Mohammed as well.